you for having me here. Um, I'm excited to talk to you about what's coming up related to produce safety. Okay, so Food Safety Modernization Act is FISMA. It's a big um, federal policy uh, through FDA, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, that is rolling out food safety standards kind of across the industry. Um, but we're going to talk specifically today about the produce rule. All right, so um, FDA passed this act back in 2011 <coughs> to really focus on a couple of things. So many of you have probably heard over the last several years different incidents that may have happened related tomato, to tomatoes or to melons or to spinach where individuals got sick. You probably heard about it on the news. Um, the produce industry gets really nervous during times like that because if you're that type of grower and there's a contamination and you've got sick people, it can really put kind of a, a hardship on your business. Um, the same can be true for fruit production. And so um, FDA decided um, several years ago, well before 2011, that these incidents kept happening and they wanted to make sure that um, they started focusing on preventing it rather than just waiting until something happened and responding to it. Um, and so they passed this law, um, but today I'm really gonna talk to you about only the small part of it because it's a much bigger law. Um, specifically focusing on the produce rule. All right, so what is the produce rule? Well, it's specifically focused on produce growers. So educating produce growers about um, food safety practices through the production, through post-harvest handling, and then kind of what happens from, from fields to what happens till it gets to the distribution network, however that gets to the consumer. Um, but it's really specifically targeted to produce that is often eaten raw. So um, while there are a number of different types of produce, not everything that is considered produce is covered under this rule. Most of the fruit production is covered because people generally eat fruit raw. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about what that means. So the FDA created a definition of produce for those things that are considered raw, and I'll talk to you about that. So FDA created the definition that you see here, and it's really any fruit and vegetable, including any combination of mixes of fruits and vegetables, including mushrooms, sprouts, tree nuts, and herbs. Okay, There is a very specific rule for sprouts, and I can talk to you about that following today. But um, I'll, I'll talk to you about where to get resources for that at the end. It does not include food grains. So what is not produce? And so I said produce is things that are generally consumed raw. So if you look through this list of what FDA has defined as what's not produce, you'll see that there are things on here that you may eat raw. Okay? I know there are things on here that I eat raw. But the reason that they put the list that you see before you here together is because of what the potential risk to public health might be based on the type of food that it is. So they generally think that even though you might eat raw cashews, that your risk is pretty low for raw cashews. The same is true, I think, um, in some cases for okra, but I've been known to pick okra out of the garden and just eat it right in the field. Anybody else been guilty of doing that? So um, we'll talk a little bit about why that may not be the best decision. Um, but all of the things that are on the list that you see here, um, those things are not qualified. So if you only produce something on this list, then this rule does not apply to you. Now, if you are a diversified farmer and you have multiple types of produce that you're growing, and you might grow okra and sweet corn and collards, but you also grow, you have, um, you grow blackberries or raspberries um, or a number of different other things, um, then it will apply to you. All right, so who qualifies as a FISMA produce grower? So that's any farm that grows, harvests, packs, or holds produce on a farm meeting the definition of produce. So any fruit and vegetable, mushroom sprout, not grain, 
that does not fall on the list that I showed with you. And you've got that list in, in your notes. Okay? So there are exemptions. So depending upon the type of grower that you are, um, you can be exempt to not have to be in compliance with what the federal government is asking of you. So if you only grow foods that were on that list, I only grow okra, and that's all that I'm going to do, then you do not qualify and you do not have to follow the things that I'm going to share with you. Should you probably do that, it might be a good idea to go ahead and to try to put some of those practices in place despite not having to do that by the federal government. Also, if you are considered a small grower or small operation and you have less than 25000 in produce sales each year on average over three years, then you're not required to follow. If you grow something and then process it in some way that offers what is a kill step, meaning reduce, reducing pathogens, and so um, processing it, cooking it, canning it, things like that. Or if you're considered small and local. Okay, so what do we mean by small and local? I'll get into that. So it's actually not too small. It's actually a, a pretty large number as you see here. So if you have um, annual food sales of less than $532,645,000, <laughs> I know that's an odd number, and that number will actually change. It's actually based on inflation. So the base number is $500,000, and then based on inflation calculated at the, the time, um, it, the number is going to shift a little bit. So kind of a good rule of thumb is if you're over $500,000, then <coughs> you really need to pay attention to this. But if you're under this $500,000 mark, um, this doesn't mean that you're exempt. If you have a majority of the food being sold directly to a consumer, so if you only sell direct to farmer's market, if you sell to direct to a restaurant or a retail food establishment, so direct to a grocery store without an intermediate step. So if you sell to um, a distributor and they sell to the grocery store, you, you still qualify for this. So um, if you are direct con to consumer marketing and you are under $500,000 and all of those direct to consumer markets are within 270 miles of your farm, then you meet what's called a qualified exemption. Okay? And so um, while you meet that exemption, you don't have to comply with going through the steps that I'm about to explain to you. But it is recommended to go ahead and do that so if ever at any time in the future you want to go beyond these practices, if you want to sell to wholesale markets and things like that, that you've been trained, you've been put in the system, and you can be contacted and you won't necessarily put yourself at risk for violating the federal law. So if you're not exempt, then what does that mean for you? So as a grower, um, you will be required to participate in a one-day training that is designed by the Produce Safety Alliance. So FDA um, is set the rule and then recruited Cornell University faculty to design a training program um, that trains on all the food safety practices that fit within the federal requirements. And then if you have been to any other type of training, so how many people have gone to some kind of GAP or Good Agricultural Practices workshop, okay? Or maybe you have gone through a GAP audit and you're trying to sell to wholesale markets. Even though what you'll be required to do for that is very similar to what you're being required to do for this, that does not qualify as your training. So there's several people that have called me to ask about that. So if, if I've been GAP audited, can I just use that to be in compliance? Well, GAP is USDA, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and Produce Safety, FISMA, is FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. And so while both are parts of the federal government, there are two separate entities that are requiring this. Um, so you will have to go through the one-day training program. 
And then following that, you'll have to have a food safety plan in place. If you did go through GAP, you probably already have started the process of developing a food safety plan, doing your record keeping and things like that. So that kind of puts you ahead of the game. After you've got that in place, there are there's an opportunity to have what's called a mock inspection or a readiness review. So you go to the training, you get your practices in place, and then the plant board who is um, leading the inspection side of this FDA requirement will come out, check everything out as a trial or a readiness review, and give you an opportunity to make any changes to, to meet the compliance. And then about a year later, they'll come back out and do the official inspection. So what are the timelines for this? So the final rule was actually published in November of 2015. And so with anything that is required of the government, it takes a while for everything to get rolled out. Um, so they have set some compliance dates. So if you are a sprouts grower, you are supposed to be in compliance of January of this year. Um, for everyone else who thinks that they may need to go through this <coughs> training, there are separate compliance dates based on the size of your operation. So if you're over the 500,000 threshold, you will need to go through a training before January 26th coming up of 2018, okay? If you are under the 500,000, but over 250,000, you will need to go to a training sometime in 2018 to be in compliance for January of 2019. If you're under 250, but over 25,000, then you'll need to be in compliance, so trained in 2019 and then in compliance by 2020, okay? There are some other um, requirements. There are some specific requirements to what's called agricultural water. They have extended the requirements for that out four years as of today. That was released this morning. Um, and I can, I'll talk to you more about what that means in just a moment. Um, and then they are still working on making some decisions about different parts of the rule that will kind of come out probably over the next year. And we'll talk more about that. So if you are required to get this training, then you should be collecting record keeping of farm practices and those things starting in 2016. It's a little bit difficult for people to know what they're supposed to be record keeping <coughs> if they haven't been through the training. <coughs> FDA recognizes that. And so um, they are going to give you an opportunity over the next couple of years to, to try to fix some of those things. But it's better to get informed and to put the practices in place as soon as possible. So what are the kind of overarching requirements? So the big one is agricultural water. So that's probably one of the most risky areas on your farm for causing some type of contamination that could lead to some type of illness. Um, water can carry, you know, E. coli that can cause some health problems, things like that. And so um, there are some specific standards for what type of water sources you're using. So you may be using groundwater, you may be using surface water or catching rainwater and using that. Um, you may be in um, an urban area and using mun municipal water. Um, so how that water is used and what you have to do to that, um, there's some specifics related to that. I won't really go into all of that. That's talked about more in the training. Um, there was one concern in the final rule that has been being debated for the last year or so um, about how you test for if the water is safe. So if you, if you are washing your produce in field or on your property in a packing house or something like that, how do you use the water? So do you add anything to the water? To make it safer, do you? Um, how do you clean the utensils or the workspace or the sink that you're using within that operation? Um, and then, how often do you monitor the safety of that water? And so, there was a particular test for E. coli that was supposed to be the standard for what we did, but there aren't laboratories 
there are very few laboratories throughout the country that can actually process that and give you an appropriate um, value for the E. coli. So they recognized that they passed a rule that people couldn't be in compliance with. So they've been debating about how to, how to make those changes. So as of today, um, there is a proposed rule that has not been accepted, but there are eight different types of tests that they're considering as the standard. And so they're reviewing laboratories across the country to see what's available so people can get to that pretty quickly. So the issue with this is when you are taking water samples, you have to get it to the laboratory in a very short period of time. You often have to keep that at a certain temperature and then it has to make it to the lab, oftentimes in less than six hours from the time you take the sample. Now, if there's one laboratory in Arkansas, how difficult is that gonna be to get there? You know, I mean, you take it and you run as fast as you can to Little Rock, right? So, I mean, sometimes that's maybe not the best thing to do. So they're really working on trying to reduce that burden and to find a test in laboratories that can do that. Um, but that will come out soon. Um, another area of controversy, but part of the rule, is the use of soil amendments, particularly raw manure, and what the application <coughs> period is for application and then when you harvest your produce. They had set some very unreasonable timelines for that. Um, there is some debate about whether raw manure will actually be even allowed to be used. We don't know what the determination of that is. Um, and so more information will come out about that. Um, but in the training program, we talk about what some of the practices are to kind of reduce your risk for that. One of the other big areas of potential risk is the human element. So what are we doing on the farm? Or um, if you have farm labor, whether it's an intern or the neighbor's kid, or if you have an H um, a, a farm worker program, if you are woofing, whatever you're doing, you're bringing people onto your farm, um, what are the practices that they're using to ensure that, that they're being safe? So that's bathroom behavior, if you have facilities available, hand washing stations, all of those kinds of things. <clears throat> Another variable that is important for produce safety is something that we really don't have a lot of control over. Um, and that's domesticated and wild animals. Well, domesticated animals, we should have control over, but wild animals, we often don't necessarily have control over unless you're able to buy some very sophisticated equipment on farm to keep them out. Um, but if you have a farm dog or a farm cat, and I know a lot of people do, we've had cats, dogs, and all kinds of animals on farm at my parents' house. and. Um, and my dog goes everywhere and, and all my vegetable gardens and everything. I'm now, now thinking about this a little bit more critically. But, um, but even birds, deer, squirrel, raccoons, all these different animals can have potential contaminants that they deposit in your fields. And so if you, they have some very specific training for if you identify this in your field, kind of what the zone is for harvesting. Because what some people do is just harvest and wash it and think that that's going to be okay. So if you had bird droppings on your blackberries, you don't want to waste. You take them in, put them in the sink, wash them. Oftentimes, you you're still have the potential of spreading that to your other crops. And so that can be um, pretty risky. Um, so there's some specific rules related to that. And then on-farm equipment, tools, the buildings, all the spaces that all of your produce moves through. How often do you clean those and sanitize and, um, and what are the practices in place for that? And so I'm not gonna go into the details of that. There's also some requirements for training anyone who's gonna be working on the farm. Um, so this can be if anyone is volunteering, interning, or is, is paid labor on the farm, um, there are some specific rules for training. If you are growing sprouts, there is a completely separate training program that you have to go to in addition to the produce school training because sprouts are the most risky kind of produce for contamination. 
And there's a resource here, um, the link that's on the page here. You can go to that and find out where workshops are being held and get information about that. So this project um, is going to be, the outreach and education will be administered through the Cooperative Extension Service. So we'll be hosting workshops across, across the state in Arkansas, and this is happening across the country. Um, there's outreach and education programs going on across the country. Um, but then on the inspection side, in most cases, it's the agriculture department that will be doing the inspections. Related to sprouts, the inspections and education oftentimes is coming through the health department um, because it's a very different thing. And so our health department in Arkansas is actually, um, they'll be the ones doing the inspections for that. So what are some of the things that you need to know as a produce grower? Um, <coughs> there will be some information coming out about what is going to happen with the ag water rule. And so that's going to be important to pay attention to because if you fall under this, you're going to need to know how you collect, where you get that to, and what the timelines and the rules are for that. Um, we probably won't know that when we first roll out our education program coming later this year and into next year. Um, so the current timelines for after you've been trained and when, when inspections start and all of that. So set um, by FDA that was released today, the mock inspections or the readiness reviews will start in 2018. So you can get your education later this year or banning of next year. Mock inspections will start sometime in 2018 and then the actual inspections won't begin until 2019. And then I talked a little bit about sprouts training. If you need that, you need to kind of make that kind of an urgent thing to do so that you can get into compliance. So I'd be happy to take any questions now.